السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم صل على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام وصل اللهم على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله الكرام ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله It's very difficult to follow up a talk about the Prophet sallallahu because uh, just making mention of him should move the heart and Imam Malik anhu, it was said that whenever the Prophet ﷺ was mentioned, just his name, that his actual face, the color of his face would change. And he never recited hadith standing up uh, or walking or anything like that. I mean, obviously, if somebody's giving a khutbah or a lecture, but he wouldn't. Somebody asked him once about a hadith he was walking, and he said, I used to have a high estimation of you as a student, but I never thought you would ask for a hadith while we were walking. So he was, he was very, uh, very strict about that. The, uh, it's very nice to see some people here, Imam Shibli, uh, dear brother, and um, also some of the people here. I haven't been to uh, Ikna for some time, and it has never had anything to do with uh, anything other than just scheduling. They've invited me many times. It's an honor to be invited by the organization, and I have nothing but goodwill uh, towards the organization. Uh, the July 4th conference, there's a conference uh, in, on the West Coast at that July 4th weekend, and a very close friend of mine, he's actually my cardiologist, so you don't want to get your cardiologist upset with you. So he always asks me to come to their July 4th weekend, and. I don't want him to put my heart in some kind of ventricular fibrillation or something like that. <laughs> he wouldn't do that, but he might tell me you're too sick to travel or something like that. So, but uh, I was looking at infiltration and they actually had a quote from my last ISNA speech in there. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to try to be good tonight. Um, first of all, uh, why Islam is a good question, why not Islam is also a good question, um, try Islam is a good question, but I think it's very important for us to realize that we're in very precarious situation. Our community is under siege. And if you don't think there's a siege going on right now, you're, you're simply out of touch with reality. After 9-11, oddly enough, the polls indicated that most Americans actually separated the event from Islam. And one of the, you know, one of the good things about the administration initially was to do that. I mean, they, they really did try to distance and separate Islam from uh, the act, visiting a, a masjid, all those things. Those were important things to calm people down and, and, and try to place the community in the context of the fabric of American society. Unfortunately, since then, things have changed drastically. Books like this have become an industry. There's now an industry of writing books against Islam. Um, I don't really want to encourage this by even putting the idea out, but one of the quickest ways to become a best-selling author is just to apostate from Islam and write a horrible book about Muslims or Islam. And suddenly you're on all these talk shows and you become an expert on Islam. I mean, there's people now that are experts on Islam because they wrote a book and they know nothing about Islam. They've never studied, they, they don't have any background, um, and, but this is the condition we're in. And taking people who have apostated from Islam, who've, who've, who've left Islam, and putting them forward as people to attack Islam is a very clever strategy. 
because you can just let them do the dirty work. It's like having, you know, not, the Conservative Party loves, not, not, loves nothing better than African American conservatives, <laughs> right? Because traditionally the African American was a completely democratic uh, caucus. Now you, you're getting African American conservatives, and the and the Democratic Party really likes to put them forward. So, uh, and that's because, well, you see, I mean, the party we're inclusive. We're we're a party of the people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's very good to use people that create this pattern disruption. Oh, well, if, if these Muslims don't even like their religion, that must be a bad religion. Do you see? And that's what they do. So the most recent one is this poor Syrian lady uh, who's come out and attacked Islam. Now, one of the results of that is in a recent Gallup poll, over 50% of Americans polled when asked, what do you like about Islam? or what do you admire about Islam? Over 50%, in fact the majority, almost 40% said nothing. And the others said, I don't know. That's over 50% of people in this country. Now, about 35% said, I like their devotion to their religion. Which is good, I mean that's a good but that's a small number of people. If you have over 50% of people that have nothing to admire about Islam, that is because these people have been effective in delivering their message and we have been completely ineffective in delivering our message. One of the major problems with the Muslim community today is that we're constantly defining ourselves by what we are not. We don't tell people who we are, we tell them who we're not. And Islam, in many ways, becomes a, 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 a player in identity politics. There are Muslims that define themselves vis-a-vis -vis the kafir. I'm not a kafir. Even though they're not practicing Islam in any serious way, just the mere fact that they're not a kafir puts them in this special category, the chosen people category. You see, so that's a problem. But then we're not constantly telling people we're not terrorists, we're not this, we're not that. Well, when you're under siege, defense is a natural response. So we have a very serious problem in this country, and believe it or not, the problem is worse in Western Europe. So if you think it's bad here, it's worse in Western Europe. It's in France, in Belgium, they're now having tests in Germany, where the homophobic tests for Muslims, if you don't pass them, they're not going to give you residency to see how you, you know, whether or not you, how you feel about homosexuality, how you feel about this, that, or the other. I mean, th these are realities. So we're moving into this inquisitorial period where people, their, their, their basic uh, patriotism is challenged, you see, and there's a big difference between patriotism and nationalism. Patriotism is love of your country, for its good and, and recognizing also that you have an obligation to change the things that are wrong about your country. Nationalism is just a blind belief in your country where you're not looking at uh, with any balance. That's not patriotism, which is why patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel. People will cling to patriotism. One of the things in this country, our community has failed and, and, and I include myself in this, and I'm sure Imam Saraj and others, I don't want to speak for them, but I, I, I think I know him well enough to say this, that, that in previous periods, in, in the, in when I first started speaking in the early 90s, and that our discourse was not balanced. There's people that say, oh, well, you've changed. But if you see a tree when it's, it's young, when it's just sprouting out, and then you come back years later and the tree is is full grown or it's, it looks different, it's not the same. You, you could say it changed but that's a natural evolution of, of a, a tree. If you're staying the same, something's wrong. You're not alive. You're dead. You shouldn't be staying the same, you should be growing. But the point is, is that our, our discourse was not balanced. We were focusing so often on what was negative about this country that we, our, our discourse was not balanced and we ended up alienating 
some people. People would come to talks and they would hear something and they, they, they would be alienated by that talk. And that's why it's not a spin when you change that discourse. It's not for spin. It should, it should be based on principle. Because Muslims are principled people. And the Prophet said, for instance, you know, I have in, 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 in the early uh, period, you know, I've said things about other religions that I regret now, not because of spin, but because I don't believe that they were Islamically sanctioned statements. I don't believe that. I really, truly do not believe that. I think they were incorrect. And, and I can't stand on that. You have to recognize what's true and what's not true in your discourse. And if we don't do that, one, we're denigrating our own religion because we're not being true representatives of our religion. It's absolutely important to do that. On the other hand, again, we are under siege as a community. And so we have to respond to the circumstances that we find ourselves in, in this country. We now must educate people in this country. We have to. We have to tell them who we are. We have to tell them who we are, not just for our sake, but for their sake. One of the things about these books, I was with, with a friend of mine, Dr. Hatem Bazayan, and, and I, we were with a man named Chris Hedges. I don't know if people know him, but Chris Hedges wrote War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning, uh, and he wrote uh, Losing Moses on the Freeway, The Ten Commandments in America. He, he's a, somebody who studied theology at, at Harvard University, and he became a war correspondent for the New York Times. He worked 20 years corresponding on, in combat conditions, writing uh, newspa uh, newspaper articles for the New York Times. During that time, he, he was in 15 wars, 15 wars. He's seen wars all over. He was in seven years in the, in the Arab world. He knows Palestine very inside out. And he studied Arabic. He's a very interesting man. But he, he was there with us, and I told Hatem Bezayan, I said, congratulations. He said, about what? I said, I was reading the book, uh, The 100 Most Dangerous Professors in America, and I saw you got a, 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 you were in there. I think he's number 65 or something. So I, so I was telling him, congratulations. And when I said that, I was being a little facetious, but when I said that, Chris Hedges said, those books are very dangerous. You know, and he was, he was actually really upset about it. These books like these, you can laugh them off, but they're very dangerous because these books are on the front in Barnes & Noble, in Borders. People come and they buy that. They trust the information. They think they're getting sound information. And these people are liars. They're fabricators of truth. They distort reality. And, and this is wrong to do that because what, what Chris Hedges said is that in every single war he covered, he said there was always a discourse of hatred that began before the war, that set the stage for that war. And he said the same thing is happening in this country. The same thing is happening in this country. And his, his book now is on the religious right of this country because he's deeply concerned about where this country is headed. And we have to take these things very serious because and I've said this before, and Dr. Almar has really reinforced this concept. We are a historical community. We are part of a historical process. We are here for a purpose. We are in the United States of America in large numbers. And we should be utilizing that fact. We have a job to do. And that job is about reconciling. Because we don't want a planet that disintegrates into more war, into more hatred, into more violence, into more conflict, into more human suffering. We don't want that. I don't want that for my children. I have five boys. I don't want that for my children. I don't want them to, to ever have to witness carpet bombing. I don't ever want them to be at the end of some type of, of weapon of mass destruction or see children blown up. I don't want them to see that. And anybody that wants uh, war is a warmonger. And our prophet was a prophet of peace. He came to bring peace. He did not come. He came in the midst of immense cycles of violence in the Arabian Peninsula. And he ended those cycles of violence. He ended those cycles of violence. He did not generate them. He ended them.
And that was part of his historical role, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a prophet of peace as much as Jesus was a prophet of peace. As much as any prophet that's coming because they call to peace. They call to salam. And that's what the prophet said after every prayer. Give me peace. Let me live in peace. Let me die in peace. Oh, give her a peace. This is the Prophet's prayer. The Quran says, Kullama awqadan naran lil haqq, aqfa'aha Allah. Every time they attempted to flame, to inflame the war, put fire on the fuel of war, God put those flames out. Allah is muqfi al haqq. That is an attribute that Allah describes Himself with in the Quran, that He puts out war. So we can imagine how much greater would be the human suffering if Allah didn't stop so much of this harm. So we as a community have a historical role. We don't want to see this country go to war with Iran. We don't want to see this country go to war in Pakistan or, or any of these places. It's not good for this country and it's certainly not good for the people on the other end. And this, this country cannot win a war with Islam. I swear to God. This country cannot win a war against Islam. I swear to God. It cannot win a war with Islam. Many, many people have tried in the past. It cannot win a war with Islam. It's a madness that needs to be stopped. It needs to be stopped and we're the people that need to explain this to the American people. Not only is Islam not a threat, but it, it has historically been able to live with many, many peoples. The first global community in human history is the Islamic civilization. The first globalized economy is the Islamic civilization. Muslims were trading with the Chinese. The Chinese were not Christians. They weren't even people of the book at that time. They were largely Buddhists and, and, and uh, Taoists. And the Muslims were trading with them. They had good relations. The silk trade is one of the great achievements of human civilization. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, let your trade, your commerce be of mutual agreement. Tijara and taravan minkum. Let this trade, let Don't eat your wealth, consume it. Uh, out of vanity, unfair. Don't steal people's natural resources. Buy them from them. And buy them at a just price. And let them be pleased with the, pro the, with the deal. That's what Allah says. And He says, let it be of mutual agreement, commerce. But if you go and you plunder people, I mean, there's a book here called Militant Islam Has Come to America. The only reason these militants have come to America is because militant America has gone to the Muslim world. If militant America didn't go to the Muslim world, you would not get militant Islam coming to America. And we don't want militant Islam. I don't want to see militant Islam. I want to see the Islam of peace. But there has to be mutual conciliation. There has to be respect. The Palestinian people have to be respected. The Kashmiris have to be respected. I mean, this is a truth. And this is not, I'm not speaking even as a Muslim right now. I'm speaking as a human being. There are people that can understand this that don't have to be Muslim. When you, when you use Apache helicopters, when you use F-16s against an armless people that have no means to defend themselves. That's simply wrong. That's wrong in any moral tradition on this planet. It is wrong. It is not right. And it needs to be condemned. When you create an apartheid system that was denounced in South Africa as evil, denounced in South Africa as evil, when you create the same system in another place, it has to be denounced as evil. You can't have something right in one place and it's not right in another place. It's right, it has to be right all over and it has to be wrong all over. And that's all we're asking for, is an even playing field. That's all we're asking for, that's what we want. That's what we want in America and that's what we want in other places in the world. We want fairness, we want justice. There are people asking why the Muslims are angry. If you're not angry about the current social conditions, you're not alive. You're not alive. You don't have a human heart. If you're not angry about 50 million people in Africa that are suffering from AIDS, and we're, not, we're spending 1.001% of what we're spending on weapons of mass destruction. We're, we're spending 
billions of dollars to learn better ways of killing people and we're not putting that money to learn better ways of healing people, that is wrong. It's simply wrong and it needs to be condemned. It needs to be condemned. We have to condemn what is wrong. And we have to honor people that stand alongside of us. We have to honor them, whatever their faith, whatever their tradition. We can disagree with them on certain things, but when they stand up for what's right, we should be there to affirm that. I want people to go home and write a letter to Michael Bloomberg. Write a letter to that man. Write a letter to the New York mayor's office and say congratulations for speaking up as an American. For defending the right of a man to dissent. Congratulations. Thank God there's still people in this country that are not capitulating to the worst forms of jingoism, of xenophobia, of hate speech. They're not conforming to it. Thank God there's still people that are willing to stand up and say, I might not agree with this man, but he has every right as an American to say what he believes. Because freedom of speech is part of this country's heritage and we have to defend that right and I'm glad that I'm here right now in this state of New Jersey and I can say what's in my heart because I don't want an America where I have to be afraid of speaking the truth where I'm going to be confused with some kind of sympathizer because I'm saying what's wrong with America and the only reason I want to say what's wrong with America is so we can change it to what should be right with America. Because this is a great country. It's a country that has an immense amount to offer humanity. The CDC, if the flu virus breaks out, everybody in the world is going to be hoping that the CDC comes up with a solution. Really, they want the Center for D Disease Control to be monitoring these things. There's things that happen here, there's research, there's development that are beneficial. But there's other things that are wrong. And we need to be balanced with how we look at this country. We need to be fair. Our discourse needs to be fair. It needs to be free from the left. It needs to be free from the right. Religion is not left and religion is not right. It's straight. That's religion. It's straight. The Prophet Wasallam said to Sufyan bin Abdullah when he said, to give, to give him some advice that he couldn't ask anyone else. He said, Say, I believe in God and then be straight. Be straight. That's the way Muslims should be. We have to be straight. Straight as arrows. If you look at what happened in Denmark, my question to the Muslims is, did we contribute in the drawing of those pictures? Did we contribute in the drawing of those pictures? We have to ask ourselves that question. Are there things that are Muslims are doing out there that are creating a wrong impression of what Islam is, of how it should be practiced in the minds of other people? We need to ask those questions about our own community. Because I don't want to contribute to that picture. That is a distorted picture of my Prophet ﷺ. But if I'm not living up to his teaching, I'm distorting his teaching. If I'm not living up to his teaching, and you cannot defend the honor of the Prophet by dishonoring his teaching. It's just not possible. You cannot defend his honor by dishonoring his teaching. Every single Muslim is an ambassador of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And an ambassador is very careful in his speech and his actions because it's all interpreted. An ambassador represents a state, a nation, and when he meets with the head of state of another nation, he's very careful in what he says, and he'll only convey what he's been told to convey. He will not extend his discourse, because if he does, he gives wrong messages. Like April Glaspie, when she met with Saddam Hussein, she gave him a, a wrong message. You see, she gave him a green light. She said, we don't, we're not involved in any inner Arab disputes. So he said, okay. And he invaded Kuwait. And boy, did he learn his lesson, you see. So ambassadors can really be dangerous, right? And they need help. You see, these people need help in understanding what Islam is. They need help in, just in communication. One of the things that I saw when I went to Denmark is they were clueless. They couldn't believe, they couldn't believe what happened. Really, they were clueless. We, we interviewed most of the people that were interviewed on the streets. They were completely opposed to the cartoons. Completely opposed to them. The Danish people, they're very polite people, most Danish people. I mean, I, I've been to Denmark three times. 
They're incredibly polite people. That's how I found them. They also had one of the finest refugee programs in Europe, which is why that many Somalians, Bosnians, and other refugees went to Denmark. And part of the problem is the Muslim community has not honored that. The Muslim criminality is higher in Denmark than other communities. There's problems. There's social problems amongst the community. But I was really struck by that fact that a lot of these people were clueless about this situation. We need to help them understand. Religious identity is no less central to a believer's life than racial identity is to other people's life. If you denigrate race, it's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. It should be unacceptable in civilized discourse to denigrate people's religion. Because that's their identity. My identity is Muslim. It's more important than my identity as a Scots uh, or a, or a scotch Irish or a Greek. Whatever. All those ethnic uh, things that are flowing in my blood. If somebody makes fun of haggies or makes fun of kilts. Scotch people wear dresses. Something like that. It's not going to bother me. But if you denigrate, you know, if you denigrate a, a black person in this culture or a Jew or people, they'll, they'll, say, they'll condemn it. They'll say that's wrong. It took a long time to get to that day when it was wrong. But if you condemn a Muslim, if you make fun of a Muslim, if you poke fun of, of a, a Christian today on television or do a skit about Mary or Jesus, people don't seem to take a lot of offense unless it's their religion. And so things need to change. We need to educate people about identity. That religious identity is no less, in fact, it's more important than racial identity. And just as we don't accept denigration of race, we should not accept denigration of religion. That does not mean you can't criticize religion. Criticize Islam all you want, but do it fairly. Don't do it filled with lies, because that's a lot of what they're doing. But these people need help. They need help understanding, interpreting. So a letter came to the State Department. This is how bad things get. A letter came to the State Department from Cairo. There was somebody there who had to leave under Dibu. He said, uh, You know, I, I'm forced to leave Egypt in extenuating circumstances. The, the, the Arabs who got the, the, the telegraph in the State Department, he, he did back in the 50s. He translated it, I'm forced to leave Egypt hidden in envelopes made in Cairo. تحت ظروف القاهرة. You see, seriously, that's a problem. When they don't know Allah means God, we're in trouble. That's, that's, a, that's a problem of translation. You know, I was mentioning earlier today, somebody was complaining about Franklin Graham. And I, and I said, I met him. You know, he actually shook my hand and I found out later he considered Muslim devil worshippers. I wouldn't shake hands with a devil worshiper. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know, I'd call him to his line. <laughs> so, but we, we have problems. Seriously, we've got serious problems of translation, of, uh, of understanding. Now, finally, I'd like to say, Joseph Nye, who's, he, he's an interesting man, but he, he's at Harvard, and he wrote a book about soft power and hard power which is a very interesting concept. One of the things that he said is power, the nature of power is of two types. The hard power is military power, it's the ability to force people to do something, that's hard power. Soft power is persuasive power, it's the power to make somebody want to do something that you want them to do. And he said that America uses too much hard power. It doesn't utilize its soft power enough, and it has a lot of soft power. And so he argues that we should be using soft power as a country, as opposed to hard power. Because if you want to win hearts, you don't drop bombs on their heads. It's as simple as that. It, it, you know, if you want to make people love you, you, you don't drop bombs on their head. Seriously. You, because they won't. They just won't like you. <laughs> and the greatest recruitment for Al-Qaeda, I mean, I'll give advice to the State Department any day on this one. The greatest recruitment for Al-Qaeda is a current American foreign policy. That is the greatest recruitment, and we want to stop that, because we don't want to see their ranks swell. I don't want to see their ranks swell. But Iraq, seriously, look what's been done. It's, it's a tragedy. And now even the conservatives are backing out. Even Buckley's saying it's a, it's a mistake. They're all backing out now. They're washing their hands of it. Fukuyama, the whole lot of them. Seriously, they're washing their hands of it. 
because it was a mistake. The only option, get out. It's as simple as that. And we should be supporting that. We should be supporting anybody that's supporting that. We want to see commerce with mutual agreement. That's what we want. That's our, our, uh, that should be our, our platform. It's not a political platform. It's a moral platform. It is a moral platform. Because religion, its role in politics is to remind people of the highest ethical standards of humanity. Islam and America share many great principles. This country shares many great principles with the Islamic religion. Most of the Bill of Rights is right out of Islamic teaching, really. Most of the founding principles of this country, right out of Islamic teaching. And so we should be calling these people to be who they are, not to be people of Abu Ghuraib. Really, we don't want that America. We don't want the America of Abu Ghuraib. We want the America of the finest people that represent this tradition. Really, the finest people that represent this truth. That's what we want to see. And that's what we should call people to. We should call the Muslims, be Muslims. Americans, be Americans. If Muslims start behaving like Muslims, and Americans start behaving like Americans, the problems will go away. They'll, they'll go away. If, if they adhere to their first principles, we can avert all of these problems. So we have to call our own community back to the highest uh, virtues and principles in our religion, and we need to remind Americans, you're Americans. This is a country that George Washington wanted to see, a country of benevolence, a country of commerce and trade, a country that did not have passionate attachments to any foreign nation. Passionate attachments to any foreign nation. Any foreign nation. Make it an even playing game. Even Stephen. Put it out there. Just make it even Stephen. That's the way. And we should not have as our number one export weapons of mass destruction. We need to end the arms trade. These are Islamic principles. The Prophet ﷺ said, The one that sells weapons during times of strife is damned to hell. Is damned to hell. And Jesus, who, you know, according to the head of this country, current head, current head, According to the current head of this country, his favorite philosopher was Jesus. So I'd just like to remind him, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. In conclusion, I have never in my entire life of study seen anything more powerful than the soft power of Islam. And I personally believe it's time the Muslims gave up the idea of hard power. It's been long gone. Muslims have not had hard power in a very long time. It's a waste of time. And I believe that we need to begin to expend our soft power. Because this religion has a persuasive force that is overwhelming. And people need it. They need Islam. They really do. I believe that. I believe that this country can benefit greatly from the teachings of Islam, whether they embrace Islam or just study the teachings. Like some people study Buddhism for benefit, they study Hinduism or, or Christianity. Just like Islam nurtured Europe out of the Dark Ages, without Europe embracing Islam, it has an immense potential to help nurture the West out of its current nihilistic morass of relativism. Really, and, and I hope that you participate in spreading the soft power of Islam. The Prophet ﷺ said, God gives with gentleness what he'll never give with violence. What he'll never give with violence.